Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Daphne Benoit, defense correspondent with the Agence France Presse, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion on how the military can contribute to climate change efforts. This very subject might be perceived as counterintuitive. In the same sentence, defense and green most often sound like an oxymoron. After all, militaries around the world are typically the largest energy consumers among government agencies and among the greatest emitters of greenhouse gases. Whether domestically or in deployment abroad, the environmental footprint of military operations remains considerable, and this has to change. Like the rest of society, the armed forces can no longer ignore the global impact of climate change. Its impact on geopolitical instability is now well established, and this has direct consequences on military operations. For example, sailors, airmen, and soldiers participate more and more to humanitarian relief operations as the number of natural disasters amplifies. In 2020 alone, 30 million people were displaced following extreme weather events. There is a growing awareness among armed forces of the need to adapt to the changing environment and reduce the carbon footprint. For the military, it's also an operational need. Consuming less energy and fuel means a lighter logistical support. Still, much more is needed to tackle the source of the problem and transition to a military model that's less dependent on fossil energies while keeping a good balance between environment protection and operational efficiency. It is my honor to introduce you to the distinguished guests who joined us today at the Paris Peace Forum to discuss how they plan to do better. French Minister of the Armed Forces, Florence Parly, thank you for being here. Senegalese Minister of the Armed Forces, Mr. Sidiki Kaba. Um, Director General for International Affairs at the Japanese Ministry of Defense, Mr. Yasushi Nuguchi. And joining us online, Cyprus Minister of Defense, Mr. Sharalombos Petridis. Hello. Estonian Minister of Defense, Mr. Kale Lanet. And Spanish Secretary General for Defense Policy, Mr. Juan Francisco Martinez Nunez. Thank you for being here today. I will invite you all to express your views uh, on the issue right after opening remarks by Florence Parly. Our panel then will conclude with a Q&A session with the audience. Madam Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I think that we have all been struck over the last few months by the images of the fires and the forest fires in Greece or in the west of the United States, the floods in Ger Germany, tornadoes in Italy, and also the high temperatures in Canada. In 2020, we saw a perfect illustration of the conclusions of the IPCC. Climate change for a very long time has ceased being a virtual threat. It is already now a reality, one of a world facing new colossal challenges, which affect us all without exception. Beyond this observation, it is crucial to think about the consequences at a time when COP26 is concluding in Glasgow. To do today, at the Paris Peace Forum, we will focus on the specific role of armies. Armed forces are particularly concerned by these issues, first and foremost because they must be ready to act in a world which is struck by the changes with, by climate change. Our armies also depend mainly on fossil fuels to carry out their missions. Therefore, the energy transition is an operational imperative. Armies must also play their role in protecting the environment, preserving biodiversity, means protecting human life, and that also means it's one of our cardinal missions. It is not, therefore, a cosmetic measure for the army. The rising level of seawaters and other events are not just natural events or human events. They are also events of which the consequences are strategic. And when the planet runs out of energy, the army will be in, on the first line to guarantee our defense, and therefore we have to show an example. We must also listen to our youth. If we do not 
show that we are able to rise to this task, we will not be able to show the example to those future generations that may serve in the army. And for those reasons, I'm very happy today to adopt an initiative carried by 22 countries and proposed by France. This initiative goes further than just a simple shared observation. It proposes concrete and commitments and will develop exchange and partnerships, including between countries of the North and countries of the Global South. This roadmap will be broken down into three different aspects, anticipate, adapt and mitigate. First of all, to anticipate, to better understand the impact of climate change on security, the strengthening of knowledge and the ability to anticipate. These are primordial. And anticipating is part of our army's DNA. And that's the role of the geopolitical observer role that we've created in the Ministry of Armed Forces. We also must encourage technological innovation. And we will be improving our carbon footprint. I'm thinking about the hybridization of our armored vehicles. For example, we must also adapt. Climate change is transforming the emissions of our armies. Extreme climate events means that we need to commit to our rescue operations we saw in the West Indies and also on mainland France as well, as was the case a year ago with the Alex storm. Therefore, it's urgent and essential to integrate this variable in our planning, in our training, and in our capacity programs. Many, a number of military operations are located in areas that are very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and therefore it is essential to analyze their exposure, but also their resilience, and also to take the necessary measures. And this is the case, for example, for port infrastructure. Climate change also has an increasing impact on the availability of resources. In a context of international competition, fierce international competition, it is crucial to secure our supply chains in terms of energy, but also to be self-sufficient in terms of energy on our operations to ensure that we have sustainable energy whilst maintaining our operational objectives. For example, we are soon going to experiment an EcoCamp initiative, which, thanks to management and smart management of flows, will allow for the autonomy of production for water and energy. And the final aspect, mitigating. We must act collectively to develop our energy autonomy, to better manage our consumption, and to decarbonize our activities and to continue our committed actions, in particular by developing the use of alternative energies. I'm thinking of uh, synthetic car fuel, for example, the development of solar energy, or the, th the thermic renovation of our fleet. This energy transition will take time, naturally, but it is essential. Across these three aspects, I think France, like other countries, already has experience to share. And the advantage of the declaration that we're adopting today is to launch, at an international level, a dynamic so that armies across the globe can be committed actors in the fight against climate change. Thank you very much. Commitment to work in common to better adapt the armed forces to climate change while reducing their footprint. Let's hope many more countries will join your initiative. Um, I will... Uh, address my question to uh, Minister Kaba. Uh, Monsieur Siliki Kaba, votre pays. Mr. Siliki Kaba, your country, Senegal, will be signing this declaration. How does your ministry see this uh, problem of climate change and have concrete measures already been taken to adapt the armed forces to these challenges? Hello. Je voudrais d'abord. I would like to first and foremost thank uh, Mrs. Apali for the invitation she has extended to me. And I would like to say that uh, Senegal will be signing this declaration, which is a very important declaration, to the extent that it will commit our armies 
it should be noted that Senegal is anticipating. Why? Well, for a long time, climate change has had harmful effects on Senegal. And we have seen increasingly a number of floods happening in Dakar. And sometimes in one day, we see quantities of rain that we used to receive in just one year. And in this context, it is important for the armed forces to take action. The army has already has also understood that its role cannot be limited to uh, national defense. With COVID, the context we're currently experiencing, the armed forces have had to intervene in health. They have deployed field hospitals in areas where COVID struck hard. In terms of climate change, however, the fight against diversification is one of the major focuses of our armed forces actions. In Casamance, we have the timber traffic. And there, there are actions that have been undertaken to eradicate this phenomenon, which can have serious consequences in terms of deforestation. And this will therefore impact the mobility of populations that will turn to other sources. What is also important to note is that anticipation in Senegal is in the framework of an important fight. We have the Green Wall, and this is a significant project that will traverse Africa. And the idea is to reforest using the armed forces to establish populations. There are important activities such as agriculture, fishing, that have significant impacts, and this has an impact on our youth. Speaking of this youth, the youth does not have the ability to survive in these areas, and they move towards the cities. And there are a number of young people who lose their lives in the Sahara or in the Mediterranean. And what does this mean? This means that this activity is one that is very serious in Senegal. And we are trying to bolster our armed forces so that they can be deployed in these projects, which are very important. As it relates to the energy transition, Senegal is committed to its plan. Some aspects have been outlined by Madame Pardy. I also think that we need to ensure that through this uh, energy transition, Africa should not be the victim. Everything that we're fighting for or fighting against today, in, as, it relates, as it relates to greenhouse gases, for example, uh, this is due to the West. And I think this needs to be thought about so that uh, this uh, part of the world can also uh, participate in this, this cause. It's a global cause, in fact. All countries are affected. We see the effects of this every day. We see what it produces in terms of uh, catastrophes and disasters. And I, those are the first few comments that I wanted to share. This initiative is one that we will support, and we will endeavor to ensure that we will be able to take action over the next few years to ensure that we obtain result, concrete results. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I'm, I'm moving to uh, the Mediterranean side. Um, Cyprus is an island state uh, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean at a climate spot, hotspot area. Um, how do you view this issue on a national and regional level? And, and what actions have you concretely taken to adapt your armed forces? Oh. Oh. 
Thank you very much for the invitation. And if you will allow me to continue in English, I want to express my gratitude to the Minister of Armed Forces of France, my dear colleague uh, Florence, for organizing this very timely and pertinent roundtable discussion with other uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, notably, COP26 in Glasgow is the ongoing um, deliberations in the EU for a climate change and defense roadmap. The time is ripe for discussing how our armed forces can contribute for addressing, of course, climate change efforts. It is evident that the strong nexus of security and defense with climate uh, change is now featuring prominently in the global agenda. And many countries have identified climate change as a national security issue. It is a threat multiplier, and every single member of our armed forces can be an agent of change, transformation, and transition to a greener, environmentally friendlier, and more, of course, sustainable modus operandi. The Republic of Cyprus is mindful of the effects of the climate change. Our region and neighborhood already is witnessing the results of this and its impact on our natural environment and, of course, the resources. That is why we advocate for the need for international and regional collaboration for addressing and mitigating the effects of climate crisis. Uh, the area of the Eastern Mediterranean is characterized as a climate change hotspot, and we are cautious of the fact that, of course, action is needed to be taken. We therefore seek to enhance regional collaboration through coordinated synergies and sharing of best practices. Most recently, and actually last month, we had the opportunity to host in Cyprus an international conference on climate change and security, which was a stark reminder of what needs to be done. The President of the Republic of Cyprus has also undertaken an initiative of developing a regional action plan with the involvement of more than 200 scientists from our wider region, as well as various international organizations who are already preparing policy recommendations, measures, as well as specific solutions. As the topic of the roundtable stipulates it is a common perception that defense has long been a global innovation leader in military hardware with a number of direct, but as well as indirect impacts on a number of everyday technological breakthroughs. Energy saving can be beneficial to defense, and defense can contribute to address climate effects and protect the environment. Promoting sustainability in the armed forces is a win-win approach for the defense sector and, in fact, the armed forces can reduce expense in energy and would benefit of a greater availability of resources to key objectives from its operational point of view. This is very important, especially if we consider that the estimated that the annual cost of energy consumption in armed forces in Europe is more than 1 billion uh, euro at the armed forces and are the wider public we are the wider public owner of infrastructure. In the case of Cyprus, uh, the Ministry of Defense, as a major employer, vast land owner and user, and consumer of natural resources, we acknowledge our, our environmental and social responsibilities. That is why it is of critical importance to have a solid environmental and energy policy for achieving high standards of environmental performance. Among the actions we took over the recent years were the adoption of a verified environmental management system in six different military camps that operate in a more sustainable now and energy efficient model and considered to be green camps. We are also implementing ecological sustainable development methods in our facilities and infrastructures and we are implementing a project for also for the introduction of renewable energy resources, notably solar and photovoltaic uh, panels. In Cyprus, we have um, quite a lot of sunshine, so this is more than possible. 
and now our military comes for energy efficiency and energy production. In addition, we also run waste recycling and waste management programs, as well as a number of awareness activities for the members of our armed forces for raising the level of knowledge and, of course, understanding for the protection of the environment and natural resources. I would like also to highlight the work of the European Defence Agency through its consultation forums for sustainable energy, which is an extremely useful forum that provides important support and expertise to EU member states. Of course, there are more things that uh, can be done. The ministerial statement, which we'll adopt today, rightly points out to several proposals that will bring added value to this cause, notably for fostering resilience, climate ad adaption, and raising awareness. And as we are moving closer to adoption the EU strategic compass during the French EU presidency, we will be bound to work for improving our armed forces capabilities and develop strategies for the cost contribution of our armed forces for mitigating climate change that will be in full harmonization and synchronization with over, over changing COP21 and COP26. These are commitments and goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and carbon neutrality by 2050. In closing, we aspire that the forthcoming presidency, uh, the French presidency of the EU, will make important strides on the issues of climate change and defense, like in the recent past with the landmark Paris Agreement. As we fully support Europe the defense, French leadership on this issue can be a catalyst for mobilizing necessary actions in our armed forces. And as a last point, I would like to thank everyone for participating and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for having given us very concrete examples of the way your armed forces are trying to, uh, to be a better, um, environmentally speaking. Um, Estonian Minister of Defence, uh, Mr. Lanet, um, I've had the chance to visit your country one year ago with the French Joint Chief of Staff, um, and I could notice that Estonia is a very, very forested land, and I'm sure the ecological awareness is very high in your country. Um, how do you mitigate uh, the carbon footprint, footprint of your military, and maybe um, in terms of biodiversity as well? Good morning, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. And, and I am very happy that uh, Madame Parli invited me to this very important panel on climate change. The aim of the Estonian Minister of Defence is uh, very clear. Military and defence sector has to support national climate targets by reducing carbon emissions and uh, of course, running costs. We always have to address all credible threats to our nation's security and many problems that are shaking the unity of society have arised from uh, climate uh, change, of course. I am talking about uh, rising sea levels, energy prices, and the shortage of natural resources. In these last days, the main topic for defence ministers has been the use of migration weapons against our borders. However, we have to act today to prevent the great climate change migration happening, a problem that is gaining momentum due to ourselves. I am glad that we are again discussing this existentially important problem today. There are actually quite a lot of practical things that we have done in Estonia. Majority of, of the infrastructure of the Minister of Defence hands has gotten a certified Green Office label. That means they are energy sufficient and a lot of focus goes to finding everyday solutions that lessen strain on the environment. There are quite a lot of electric cars used in the 1st Infantry Brigade campus. We are equipping, equipping, equipping more and more infrastructure with the solar panels. 
building new and improved radars to help speed up the construction of new wind farms in mainland of Estonia and also in the sea. These steps, the steps don't just help preserve our nature, but also helps us to secure energy security and address the hottest topic globally. There are still a lot to be done with the Army's forces and equipment, and we are already putting increased money in cooperation with the defence industry to research and development, for example, new support vehicles to run on hydrogen and so on. I would like to end my brief comment with a plea to act similar in fighting climate change as we are defending our countries, nations, democratic values and our people preserve and protect the environment so that our armies will have something beautiful to protect on the battlefield. Thank you, thank you and, and good discussions on the conference. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Um, um, turning to uh, Mr. Martinez uh, Nunez, um, good morning. Uh, what is Spain's, uh, Spain Defense Ministry priority uh, when it comes to tackling the uh, carbon footprint issue? What, what is really the, your, your key priority at your ministry? Merci, Madame Denouac. This is our key. Thank you. The military contribution to mitigate uh, the armed forces' impact on the environment. Madame la Ministre Parly, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Paris Peace Forum for their continued contribution to peace and security in the world. Also, uh, on behalf of Minister Robles, I would uh, like to thank and appreciate this invitation to the Spanish Ministry of Defense to share our views on this important issue of how the military can contribute to this comprehensive effort. Thank you, Minister Pardi. It is a fact that climate change far reaching effects are a direct cause of instability. As such, climate and security are becoming more and more intertwined. The situation claims for a, an ambitious international and cross-government approach. The contribution of the military to this approach is challenging. As as armed forces around the world need to first understand and then adapt. And that is not an easy task, since the measures taken have to be balanced against military effectiveness and mission accomplishment to ensure defense. Besides, the role of the military is important to promote the citizens' awareness and to achieve the full commitment of the country. This requires from the military to carefully consider its effects on operational planning and also on capability planning. We must ensure our equipment is valid to operate in extreme weather conditions, but also we need to ensure that uh, we use the most efficient technology in a sector that, uh, as the Army Forces, is very intensive in energy consumption. Um, <clears throat> as part of the Spanish National Adaptation Plan to Climate Change, 21-2030, now the Spanish Army Forces are implementing an array of mitigation measures aimed at reducing our demand and increasing our energy resilience and efficiency. A 
And so far, 30% of military energy consumption comes from renewable forces. And the use of electric and hybrid vehicles for day-to-day -day routines is the rule and not the exception. The same can be applied to military infrastructures in Spain. And we are also very committed to support the United Nations, NATO and EU efforts to fight against climate change and its impact on global security. Then our support to the French Ministry of Armed Forces initiative to launch a joint declaration about the role of the armed forces in climate change within the Paris Forum. That is only a small token of our willingness to contribute to this pressing issue. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and um, finally, I'll give uh, uh, the floor to uh, Mr. Noguchi from the Japanese Ministry of Defense. Um, Asia is extremely exposed uh, to extreme weather events. Um, are Japanese armed forces already cooperating on these issues with other countries on a regional level? Thank you very much for your question. And uh, on behalf of my Minister of Defense, Kishi, I would like to express my deep appreciation and gratitude to Madam Minister, uh, Minister Parin uh, for this kind invitation. And thank you very much for your question of international cooperation of the Japanese self-defense force. All of you know that Japan is a country known uh, as a uh, having a lot of natural disasters, including typhoons, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunami, inundation. That is why our self-defense force has a lot of experience of being engaged in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And self-defense force of Japan is sharing their expertise, experience, and knowledge and lessons learned through this uh, operation, disaster relief operation in Japan with uh, many countries, particularly focusing on Southeast Asian countries and Pacific Island countries. In this way, self defense Force of Japan has been cooperating uh, to build up, to, en to enhance their capability to address uh, natural disasters. Indeed, they are suffering a lot from increasingly severe damages caused by the climate change. And that is why the armed forces of those countries should enhance their capability. Uh, I would like to emphasize that during the pandemic, it is very important to pay careful attention for the spread of COVID-19. It's not easy to uh, be engaged in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief activities during the pandemic. Because we, if we don't have a proper uh, measure to prevent the COVID uh, in the shelter of evacuees, there will be uh, easily spreading COVID because they are dense situation. That is why this kind of expertise or know-how we are uh, providing and sharing with these countries. During the pandemic, our armed forces, uh, self-defense force or cooperation was limited. But now as we are under control of COVID-19, we are restarting dispatching our self-defense force team to those countries of Southeast, Southeast Asia. And talking about the Pacific Island countries, Early September, uh, we organized the first ministerial meeting of defense with Pacific Island countries. And one of the important agenda was the climate security and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And I'm very pleased to uh, express gratitude to France because we invited France as a partner country for this uh, Japan, Pacific Island countries, uh, because uh, France is the only European country which has a military presence in Indo-Pacific, 
So uh, we can work closely uh, together in order to enhance their capability for re their disaster re reduction. And having said that, well, uh, I would like to emphasize that climate security, climate uh, change cannot be solved by only one country. So uh, we need cooperation and we'd like to enhance further our international cooperation together with like-minded countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, given the time we, uh, that's left, um, I will uh, directly go to the questions um, from the audience, and um, two of them are related. Um, uh, to you all, um, uh, somebody is asking, should military force be used to protect shared environmental resources, for example, coral reefs, forests, etc., and which is linked to another question by a retired military officer, how can the military and rebel military groups be controlled or stopped from destroying sub forests in sub-Saharan Africa? So um, if any one of you wants to answer that question, uh, Florence Parly maybe has a reaction to this? Je vais commencer. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, start by answering that. Of course, uh, the armed forces have a role to play in terms of uh, protecting natural resources, uh, which are commons. Uh, and this is already the case uh, for the protection of uh, uh, resources in the ocean, in the seas. And uh, the uh, ships uh, that belong to the Navy are currently being used uh, at, to the tune of 70 percent uh, to fight against uh, trafficking, illegal uh, uh, fishing, and also pillaging uh, that takes place in terms of uh, natural resources. So I think that this uh, issue is absolutely key. And if I can add uh, to that also in terms of the maritime uh, sector, it's very important in terms of the initiative that we uh, took and that 22 countries have chimed that we need to be able to exchange on good practices. For example, we have uh, launched an initiative uh, with uh, researchers to try to understand what uh, migrations in terms of uh, uh, tuna fish, uh, and uh, these are being caused uh, by uh, climate change, uh, what will be the effects of those uh, in terms of uh, tensions and conflicts? Uh, the fishermen up to now uh, uh, had uh, national fishing areas, but those fishermen will have to move uh, to international waters where there are no rules and there are no, there's no particular law. So I think that those particular experiences uh, is uh, something that we need to share so that we have a better understanding of of, uh, what our armed forces can do in order to preserve those natural resources. Uh, thank you, Minister. Now, I think that this is uh, absolutely crucial. I've just uh, We've talked about uh, the fight uh, against uh, against uh, illegal deforestation in our country, and this is a uh, uh, part of a network of uh, bandits that use these resources to try to to fuel wars. And uh, so we need uh, to also focus on a, another aspect uh, and uh, something that is going on in, in uh, Senegal. So the Great Green Wall, for example, it is this is very important because we have uh, fishing, um, agriculture, and uh, uh, livestock. That's, uh, 70 some, that uh, concerns 70 percent of our population, particularly young people. Uh, we have a very young population. And if that, those young people don't have uh, jobs, then they will go off uh, um, and in various adventures, and that will lead to more immigration. So we have to really focus on this, uh, protect, protecting the biodiversity. But at the same time, uh, this uh, plays a key role. We have to preserve the, the economy in our country so that young people don't go off and elsewhere. Mr. Lanet or Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I make a short comment? Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> okay, yes, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the end of my short comment, that uh, we have to protect our, uh, our national resources and also our uh, beautiful uh, forest, and, and uh, not just only our people and our borders. We, we have to look uh, as whole our country and, uh, and, and 
my personal opinion is that we, 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 our national defense forces have to do with their all means also to protect and serve our country in the best way. And that means that we have to protect our national resources also. Thank you. Um, another question uh, by the audience. Um, um, is a great subject to cover. Uh, I don't know if we will have time, but um, how are the fights against environmental destruction and nuclear proliferation connected? Does anyone want to try to answer that question? Well, that's a complicated one. Um, maybe um, I'll have a question actually for... Um, well, I can take that if you like. Uh, no, I think that uh, uh, this uh, brings us to the debate on the uh, contribution of different forms of energy to reducing or limiting uh, climate change. Uh, and I think that in terms of uh, the idea be behind the question, uh, we, it's about uh, uh, presenting uh, nuclear proliferation as a source of problems in terms of the uh, environment and the climate. I, I, but I see this uh, uh, as something which allows us to um, be able to decarbonize our energy and also to be able to contribute uh, to this fight against uh, climate change. I know that this is... It's a very controversial debate, uh, but uh, this is a choice that France has made uh, to be able to move forward in order to deal with a challenge, uh, which is the increase in the use of energy. And uh, whatever country is concerned by that, uh, we have to develop renewable energies, but also at the same time, we have to develop nuclear uh, power because uh, this is a decarbonized power, and we really need that. But I'm not sure that that was the idea behind the question that was asked. Uh, to this uh, uh, theme of um, energy, um, nuclear energy and renewable energies. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, uh, we know, Japanese know that the humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and also uh, very devastating damage to the environment. That is why nuclear disarmament, uh, nuclear uh, non proliferation are very important issue uh, for Japan. Prime Minister Kishida is from Hiroshima, and he is very determined to nuclear disarmament. Of course, uh, the faced, Japan faced, is faced with a very tight and severe security situation. So uh, we need uh, Japan-U.S. Security Alliance, uh, but uh, the government of Japan is uh, working very hard for the no nuclear non-proliferation and non uh, nuclear disarmament, and hopefully we will have a very successful outcome of the NPT level conference, which will take place early January next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of this panel discussion. Thank you all again for joining us today to discuss this critical issue. Uh, the defense ministers which, which have signed the joint statement unveiled by Mrs. Parley today have committed to work together to play their part in combating climate change and better adapt their armed forces to this changing environment. So um, I offer to meet next, uh, at the next edition of the Paris Peace Forum in 2022 to review the progress of this collective effort. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Minister, Ms. Mr. Minister, and thank you very much for the guests uh, that join us online. Thanks a lot.